Welcome everyone. Greetings wherever you are. We're pleased to see so many from countries in locations that span the globe. I'm Judy Lang, Chief Scientist of AGRA, Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. 25 years ago, we pioneered an innovative approach for examining the health of coral reefs with surveys of their key structural and functional components. AGRA created the first open access regional database of Caribbean coral reef condition, provides technical support to marine managers, and continues to develop online education, management, and communication tools. Our mission includes catalyzing the conservation of coral reefs with collaborative partnerships, like the one you'll hear about today. And joining me are my colleagues, Patricia Kramer, AGRA's Program Director, and Shirley Gunn, our Administrative Lead. We're delighted to be able to host this webinar today. The sea urchin Diadema antelarum is a key herbivore in the Caribbean. When I grew up in Jamaica in the late 1950s, its reefs were famous for the high cover and architectural complexity of their stony corals. In the daytime, sea eggs, as we call diadema, clustered around the bases of the large corals or took shelter in crevices between the coral skeletons. At night, they emerged to feed on benthic algae, opening up space for stony corals to expand across the bottom and where coral larvae could settle and grow. At the time, there were similarly large populations of D. antelarum elsewhere in the Caribbean. Between January 1983 and early 1984, a mass mortality of D. antelarum that began in Panama in the extreme southwestern Caribbean gradually spread throughout the entire region even reaching Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean Sargasso Sea. About 98% of the urchins on these reefs died. Most of their populations have never recovered and neither have most Caribbean reefs, many of which are now overgrown with a diversity of benthic algae or other invertebrates. The loss of this key herbivore compounded by other stressors reverberates throughout our reefs and adjacent ecosystems today. Then in early 2022, the antelarum urchins were suddenly observed dying at scattered locations in the Northern and Eastern Caribbean with behaviors that were reminiscent of the 1983 die-off. A small group quickly formed the Diadema Response Network to counter this perceived threat. We developed a diadema tracking map that has now received over 700 reports. We solicited help in collecting and preserving samples of healthy looking and dying diadema for investigations into the cause of the mortality by other scientists. The international collaboration that resulted includes many researchers, managers, and citizen scientists, some of whom are here with us today, along with a few other colleagues who've given us advice or other assistance. We sincerely wish to extend our profound gratitude to everyone who has been involved in any capacity in this collaborative effort. Today, we have the amazing opportunity to hear from two of our seminal colleagues. Alwyn Hilkema will first describe the signs of illness and death in De Antelarum and the spread of the 2022 die off across the Northern and Eastern Caribbeans. He lives on Seba in the Northeastern Caribbean Sea and is affiliated with Van Holler and Stan and Wageningen. And universities in the Netherlands. And then Ian Houston will explain how samples of the antelarum provided by our Caribbean colleagues were used to identify a cause of the 2022 die-off. 
Ian is a professor in the Cornell Marine Mass Mortality Lab at Cornell University in the USA. And then after these presentations, there will be opportunities for questions and discussions with the speakers and perhaps other participants. So now I will ask Patricia to please introduce our first speaker, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. And Alan, I wanna thank you so much for being our speaker today. Um, Alwyn uh, has been doing amazing research in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, looking at uh, coral reefs and how do you restore herbivore populations. Um, he has been a pioneer in looking at how uh, you can actually rear um, larvae of the urchins and replant them on their reefs. He has very, many innovative techniques to do uh, restoration. And he was one of the first, actually, he was the first person who sounded the alarm on um, the diadema die-off. And through his first observations, uh, he was um, synergized the effort for us to work together throughout the region. So I'd like to welcome Alwyn, and um, he is already here. And take it away, Alwyn. Thank you, Patricia, for your uh, kind introduction. And thanks to Agra for organizing this webinar. Uh, great to see so many of you um, here today. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to tell you more about the 2022 Diadema die-off. That for me started uh, on uh, 15th of March last year. And um, I remember it very well because we just came back from uh, a survey that we did on a, a dive site we call Diadema City for good reason. Uh, it had the biggest diadema population around Seba, around 4,000 individuals. And we were monitoring it to see if the population was growing or remaining stable and potentially using some animals for restocking experiments. And that day, the population looked fantastic, really healthy, um, a lot of fish also um, on that dive site. So it was a great dive. We came back, I stepped on the dock and uh, somebody from the local dive shop uh, approached me and said, do you know that the diadema in the harbor are dying? And I didn't know. So I jumped in and um, this is uh, what I saw. Uh, a lot of that skeletons, uh, some older, some newer, and the diadema that were still alive uh, were not attached to the substrate anymore. They were um, sort of swaying back and forth with the swell. Uh, there was a lot of swell at that moment uh, and they, they showed very abnormal behavior. And when I saw this, I immediately had to think back about a short video that um, uh, George Patterson showed me like a month earlier at the, reef, um, at the Grazer Restoration Workshop in Florida about dead diadema in um, St. Thomas. And I immediately thought this, this was too much of a coincidence that diadema were dying at a large scale on two different locations. And then when I checked my phone, I came out of the water, checked my phone, and I saw a friend from St. Eustatius sending me a message saying that the diadema and Stasia were dying too. So I knew, okay, this is, this is no coincidence at all. Something else is happening. Uh, I reached out to a couple of people uh, who also reached out to more people, and we formed the diadema response network, as, as Judy uh, explained with the purpose to monitor this, this new die-off, um, to see where else it, it occurred, uh, yeah, document, and most importantly, in the end, find out uh, what was causing the diadema to die, because of course, this was of great concern to everyone um, involved in Caribbean coral reef research or management or uh, elsewise. Um, so I'm living on Seba and uh, we're working on intervention methods to, uh, to restore the diadema populations. And some of that are done in the field. We provide them with shelter uh, in critical life phases. And some of that is done in the lab. And uh, so we also developed a culture method for the, uh, for the diadema uh, to culture them. So we had around 100 juvenile diadema in the lab the moment the die-off was observed in the harbor. 
And unfortunately, or fortunately, we also take in or water next to that diadema population uh, that was dying at the moment. So uh, unfortunately, because we would lose many of the diadema we had in the lab, but fortunately, we were at least able to very closely observe them and document what was happening. And uh, signs of illness for us on SEBA all sort of happened in the same order of things. Uh, first, the water vascular system stopped working. Uh, diadema fell off the vertical surfaces of the tanks, uh, were swaying in the current that was mostly seen in the field. Um, if they were still moving around, they were doing that with their spines. So they were standing or walking on their spines. And after that, um, the, um, the epidermis started to slough off the animal and they started to lose their spines. Uh, all of these signs were very similar to the signs of illness described for the uh, die-off in the 80s. So I'll show you a couple pictures of, of what we observed uh, those first days. Uh, so this is typical. We, we saw this a lot, that diadema were just falling off the surface of the tank. Um, and uh, here you can see that this diadema has sort of flaccid extended tube feet that are still moving, but not adhere to the surface anymore. And then with, within an hour or two, uh, the tube feet were just gone, retracted, something else happened to them, and they were only standing on their, on their spines. Um, so very abnormal behavior. Uh, so this is standing on their spines. The spines also became more brittle, probably because the epidermis start to uh, um, start to be removed from the spines. Uh, epidermis necrosis and and spine loss were sort of the next steps, and this all happened very quickly. And within two days, uh, infected animals in the lab uh, died. And uh, these are some observations from the uh, from the field. So very, very quickly. Um, Agra uh, hosted the Diadema tracking map. Uh, and I want to thank everyone that, that probably a lot of you actually uh, inserted uh, your data of healthy and abnormal urchins. But with that, we were able to get a good view of where this started and how it spread over the Caribbean. And St. Thomas was the first place in January 22 where this was observed, these kind of die-offs. And then it sort of remained localized for a month, a little month over a month. And then um, it popped up in very spread out regions all the way from um, Mexico in the west of the Caribbean to Jamaica in the middle. And a lot of Eastern Caribbean islands were also infected in March, including uh, Ceva and St. Eustatius, where I just told you about. Um, and then it's further spread also to the Dominican Republic, other Eastern Caribbean islands in May. And um, I think in end of May or June, Florida, Curacao were uh, also reporting die-offs and finally Aruba in, um, in July. And that's where it stopped, at least at that moment. Uh, we didn't hear any uh, of any observations in the remainder of uh, 22. Um, so we looked at the uh, spread and we found that a lot of the first occurrences in a new territory happened close to a harbor. Uh, to be more precise, 11 of the 25 first occurrences were within one kilometer and 18 of 25 were within three kilometer. So we suspect that marine traffic played a role uh, with, the, with the spread of whatever this um, was uh, around the Caribbean. Uh, with ballast water, bilge water, or in a different way. And then after uh, a new location was um, infected, uh, this die off spread to other reefs, other populations uh, in a couple of weeks. And that could be with or with, without the current, or maybe also through boats. Um, so back to um, Diadema City, the dive site uh, that I told you about earlier that had around 4,000 Diadema. Uh, is around 500 meters upstream of the harbor. So we sort of knew that as soon as we saw the dive in the harbor, that sooner or later it, it would also go there. And of course we hoped, but it didn't help. And within around two weeks, um, we saw the first uh, abnormal urchins at, at Diadema City. And we monitored weekly, counted all the dead, uh, the sick and the, the healthy individuals. And I mean, yeah, it was just shocking. So many dead individuals. I think 
almost 4,000 Dyneema were sort of rotting there on the bottom. Um, yeah, we're not the best dives of my life, I have to say. Uh, in the end, it, um, the Dyneema density was reduced from around four per square meter, which is pretty high, to around 0 0.05. And that sums up to around 99% mortality um, for this specific location. So um, with a, a group of uh, people, we, um, we looked at the spread, uh, the signs of illness, the lethality, and we looked at similarities and dissimilarities to the 1980s die-off. And uh, quite a few things were similar, but some others were dissimilar. And uh, similar is that it was water, waterborne, like the, the diadema in the lab got ill by just using water from close to a population. Um, infected diadema died one or two days after the first visible signs of illness. Uh, the lethality was really high comparable to the 80s die-off. Uh, we also had a larvae culture that developed normally, although we used the same water, uh, and they also settled. So larvae apparently were not affected. And there were uh, Trypnostus, West Indian sea eggs, and rock boring urchins living around the diadema that were dying, and they 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 were not bothered by it. And um, and all survived, didn't show any strange behavior. So that was all similar to the 80s, uh, but also a couple of things were dissimilar. Um, in the 80s, the main spread was through currents, while now it mainly seemed to spread to marine traffic. Um, also in the 80s, uh, no populations escaped uh, the die-off. So, and that's different from now, even the, so a large part of the Caribbean was never um, infected but also some populations or some islands that, that showed die-offs still have remaining healthy populations. Also Seba still have populations that were never um, um, exposed to the, to the die-offs. Uh, also the die-offs seem to change a little bit. They appear to become less lethal in the summer of 22 when the die-off progressed uh, and the spread also slowed down and didn't reach all areas of the Caribbean, um, so far at least. So uh, I'm going to end this with a shimmer of hope because directly after the die-off, uh, we saw pretty high recruitment and that was also observed in different other areas. Uh, it might have been that um, animals that were exposed to the die-off um, were still able to spawn or, or spawn just before they, they died, but we had very high recruitment in 2022. And this is the same graph I showed you before, uh, but now I extended it for a full year because we kept monitoring the population and we actually saw high recruitment and are now back at around uh, 1.5 diadema per square meter. Um, so yeah, at least that is, that is hopeful. Uh, something else, what I consider hopeful is that, um, and that's also different from the eighties, uh, is that by now we have different restoration approaches that are ready or almost ready to implement on a larger scale. Um, and um, shortly going to show uh, three of them. Uh, one of them is developed by uh, Stacy Williams uh, in Puerto Rico. She found out that you can actually collect settlers in the water column with settlement substrate and head start them in the lab and then restock them on the reef. And that actually works really well there. Uh, and here on Seba, we, we uh, use bioballs to do that, but you can also use different substrates. Um, we also uh, developed a method of assisted natural recovery uh, in which we provide shelter during the critical life phase when they're really small. And we do that by putting the bioballs uh, that are no normally used in pond filters to put them on the reef in the settlement season and the diadema settle in them and actually helps them to survive and reefs that have this have a higher recruitment rate. Uh, so that's great. And then um, here on Seba, but also in Florida by uh, Josh Patterson and his group, uh, new culture methods are developed. And um, here you see a picture of my colleague Tom using a shaker table uh, to culture larvae. And this has resulted here and in Florida in, in many, uh, many settlers, many juveniles. So uh, of course this is all great, but uh, we have to know what caused these uh, die-offs because otherwise all these approaches might also be in vain or very short term. Um, so for that, I'm really happy to hand over the word to, to Ian. 
Um, but first, uh, I want to thank um, all the people that contributed to the uh, Diadema tracking map, uh, Agra for organizing and hosting this webinar, but also uh, the tracking and uh, my colleagues that um, helped me with uh, with writing this all down in the uh, frontage paper. You see the reference here uh, where you can also find more details. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, Ian, yeah, uh, we can't wait to hear your uh, discoveries. As Ian is getting ready, um, Ellen, I want to thank you so much, uh, especially for giving us a closer look at what the mortality actually happened with the urchins, how they died, that process, and showing us the overview of how it had spread throughout the 25 countries. I love that last slide that you were showing on the little baby um, urchins, and uh, I thank you. Uh, for questions for Alwyn, um, we can write them in the chat and we'll have a chance to talk more with Alwyn at the end. I'm going to turn it over now to Judy, who is going to introduce Ian. Thank you again, Alwyn, and go ahead, Judy. And thank you, Patricia. And I will ask Ian to please share his screen with us. And I see he already has, so I don't have to ask him. Um, Ian Hewson is a marine microbiologist and a biological oceanographer with the Cornell University's Marine Mass Mortality Lab. He is fascinated by the complex interactions that link marine viruses to the organisms with which they associate and their environments. It was his group that identified the virus that's responsible for the mass mortalities in some of the species of asteroid sea stars that die from what's called starfish wasting disease during some years in some locations of the Northeast Pacific. Ian was also an early addition to the Diadema Response Network team and the driving force behind the collaborations that resulted in the collection and subsequent identification of an agent that is responsible for their death in 2022. So Ian, please take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Judy. Thank you to everybody for being here. Super, super excited to be able to present some of this work. And uh, thanks, Alwyn, for that great lead in to, to this presentation. So uh, as Judy mentioned, I'm, I'm a professor of microbiology, but don't let that scare you. I'm actually a marine ecologist. I'm just in the wrong department. Um, I work on a variety of different marine diseases, and I lead uh, the Cornell Marine Mass Mortality Lab, which you can see our logo at the top right hand side there. Um, today, what I'm going to be discussing is uh, what we found as far as the causative agent for this um, mass mortality. But I need to start off just by saying that uh, the we that I use refers to a huge number of investigators. I'm, I'm simply the voice for many, many collaborators across the region, uh, many different institutions. You can see all of their logos here. Uh, it was a tremendously huge uh, effort to try and get materials together as well as do analyses. Um, some core sort of people at the University of South Florida and USGS, um, amongst many, many others as well, not to exclude uh, anybody here. Um, and it, the important thing also is to say very big thank you to everybody here as well as everybody who was involved from the many different countries involved. I think it's rare that I've been able to be involved in a project which involves so many different countries, so many different jurisdictions within uh, different countries. And uh, we're currently continuing to collaborate with many of these uh, different regions as well. And we look forward to collaborating with any that we have not yet collaborated with as well. Um, we're really, I'm very excited to work across international boundaries and uh, really sort of advance science through collaboration. Um, so just to start off, uh, I think Alwyn sort of gave a really nice uh, introduction as to what is different, what's, um, you know, what a, diff a normal as well as an abnormal animal sort of looks like, how they how they differ from each other in terms of their behavior, as well as uh, some of their uh, characteristics. Uh, this is a really sort of bad photo, but just to point out that throughout this talk, I'll be referring to healthy animals as normal, and we call them grossly normal simply because uh, they sort of, from an external viewpoint, they look kind of as they should do, and then abnormal, which we're referring to as, or disease ones as we're referring them as abnormal. Um, the reason that we avoid healthy and diseased is we don't really know whether, uh, at least going into a new disease phenomenon, whether it is in fact a disease or not, or whether it's some sort of environmental upset. And so that was a starting point for uh, the investigation that um, we were involved in. 
Um, we had some key questions uh, related to this investigation uh, that started off. I mean, obviously, the biggest question is what causes the diadema antelarm mass mortality? Um, going into this, we had no idea whether it was some kind of environmental stressor. Uh, there was sort of a few different weird things happening in the region at the time. Uh, our experience working with sea star wasting on the West Coast is that you could have many, many different phenomena that lead to exactly the same um, outward signs uh, in any given echinoderm. And of course, these are echinoderms uh, for which, you know, they basically have limited re repertoires of, of responses. Um, and also sort of, it might've been a pathogen as well. And we wanted to basically go after everything that we could to figure out, you know, was it a virus? Was it a bacterium? Uh, was it something um, eukaryotic microorganism, which ultimately that's the punchline, but um, we didn't actually get to that answer before going through all of the others. And then we had a couple of secondary questions, which we are currently addressing, which is why now? Has something changed very recently? Uh, is this an invasive pathogen, if it indeed it is a pathogen at all, which we now know it is? Uh, and then finally, what can we do about it, uh, which, you know, how can we inform managers to protect urchins and prevent future occurrence. And so these are the types of questions that um, will come sort of later. Uh, we're currently investigating those at the moment with collaborators. Uh, but just at the moment, what I'm going to be describing is our initial investigation to identify the causative agent for this condition. So it all starts, of course, with appropriate sampling. Um, this is some work which was a huge amount of work in St. Thomas as well as SABA. Uh, Alwyn was involved with this, as well as uh, Marilyn Brandt's group at the University of Virgin Islands. Um, we focused initially on specimens from reference sites, which are sites which uh, basically didn't have any observable mass mortality at all. It didn't have any abnormal urchins at all. And then uh, this was well away from sites where we actually did observe the, the disease uh, or the condition, in which case we collected both grossly normal, which are the healthy animals, as well as abnormal at the affected site. This kind of sampling design is super important because at any given site, when you do see a disease, you're likely to see some level of subclinical infection, or in other words, uh, some animals that perhaps are infected by a pathogen, uh, but have not as yet shown disease signs by the time of collection. And so we felt it was super important to basically go to another site, a reference site, well away from the disease front uh, to be able to have material to collect. And in fact, at some locations, um, for example, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, they've never seen this condition at all. And so it provided a very useful reference uh, to see what was normal. Um, this basically after animals were collected, it involved very rapid sampling, uh, necropsy, uh, preservation of materials in a way which would allow a huge variety of different types of, of analyses downstream, including RNA and DNA based as well as histopathology. Uh, a very, very large effort and a big, big, big thank you to uh, those individuals who were involved with those. Um, after that, the uh, samples were transported to the labs at Cornell, uh, to the Fish and Wildlife Commission in Florida, University of South Florida, and the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, a key point of this is, in fact, we did independent investigations as to the cause initially. Uh, we weren't really talking with each other, uh, for, and that was on purpose so that we didn't sort of bias what we were finding. And then we finally came together uh, a few weeks, a few months, actually, after we first kind of had our idea as to what was actually happening. So a very big thank you to those involved. So what types of samples did we actually take? Uh, this is what it looks like. And I apologize for my cartoon making skills. This is the South Park version of a uh, diadema. Um, essentially, we have some tissue samples, so we wanted to make it as widely sort of applicable to many different approaches as we could. So basically, these were preserved in RNA later. Uh, we basically obtained samples from body wall, spines, gonad, intestines, salamic fluid. Uh, we also collected specimens for tissue bi biochemistry, including um, sort of analysis of different chemical components, uh, including from the diadema, as well as some patric algae. Uh, made good observations of the gross appearance uh, internally, as well as externally of the animals. Uh, also collected specimens for histopathology, which is incredibly important uh, to basically complement or, in fact, in this case, lead the investigation to tell us what might be going on. So that involved taking samples, including half of an animal, uh, and preserving them in uh, preservatives so that they are amenable to microscopic approaches. At the same time, we also collected samples at a few sites from uh, water column to look at what types of microbes might be there, as well as some sediments from some of the sites as well. And this was a huge effort facilitated by all of those organizations you can see at the bottom of this screen. 
So the first thing, obviously, that we uh, were sort of curious about was environmental abnormalities, weird conditions. And I mentioned these at the beginning of the talk, and Alwyn mentioned that uh, diadema, you know, this die-off first appeared near ports and harbors, which was perhaps our first kind of indication that perhaps this was being moved around, or perhaps the conditions in those ports and harbors might have been related to this. So when we uh, we received reports from uh, the University of Virgin Islands group that in fact there was a large amount of material at some of the sites uh, that looked like hair-like structures. This would indicate some kind of decaying bloom, a lot of mucus in the water, uh, but it wasn't at all of the sites. Um, it was only at a few of them, uh, but this sort of led to sort of a, a, a minor investigation to see what might be happening from an oceanographic standpoint. And on the top left-hand side here, you can see uh, a sea whips image. So this is looking at chlorophyll A concentrations. The more red, uh, the color, the more chlorophyll there is. Uh, normally, the oceanography of the basin is that you have this down at the bottom, which is the North Brazil current. Occasionally, you actually end up with uh, small eddies, which can spin off from this up into the region. And so what you're going to see here when I hit play is an animation of the sites which we investigated, which are the uh, located in uh, yellow here, these little yellow circles, as well as the affected sites as they became affected, which turned red. Uh, and so in terms of chlorophyll, and then following this will be temperature, you can basically see that um, there was not a lot of eddy activity at the time, perhaps. Then there was an eddy which came through the southern uh, islands there, uh, but it didn't seem to correspond really well with any of the environmental conditions that we were observing, at least by satellite oceanography. We're continuing to work on this uh, with collaborators to try and facilitate this in better resolution uh, than what's present right here. But the uh, point is, is that there may have been environmental conditions which might have favored uh, the emergence of this condition, but we as yet have no data to support that, or at least no cohesive data to support it. So what can we look for as far as uh, agents of this condition? Uh, this is a little schematic just to illustrate uh, what's known as the central dogma. Okay, so in any given organism, uh, they're usually surrounded by a collection of different types of microbes, including bacteria, which is these little brown things here. Uh, viruses are included in that as well. And they live together in what's known as a holobiont. Uh, within that entire holobiont, every single organism out there has some form of nucleic acid. Normally, this is DNA, which you can see here, which is the uh, core genetic information of an organism, which encodes for all of the possible functions that an organism has. Uh, basically, it is, um, you know, it's, it's their information storage. Uh, this then is undergoes a process called transcription into something called RNA, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, thanks to the uh, various uh, worldwide events that have happened in the last few years. RNA is basically telling us what is active in a community, uh, tells us what the organism is actually doing, and then that undergoes a process called translation into proteins, and this is basically the end result of it. That's your enzymes, your cell structures, etc. Um, that's basically, this is known as the central dogma, and this allows us some opportunities to uh, basically apply tools to be able to target specific questions about what might be going on. Notably, we can target DNA uh, by something called viral metagenomics, which tells us about the different types of viruses that are there, as well as amplicon sequencing, which tells us about the bacteria. And then we can target RNA uh, through transcriptomics, which tells us about what the host is actually doing, as well as any viruses uh, which might be there as well, as well as some of the other cellular constituents, because of course they are producing gene transcripts as well. Um, so where we started with all of this, we made the decision to commence our uh, research, at least in the lab, with something called transcriptomics, which is basically surveying expressed genes from the, uh, from the urchin, as well as all of the microbiome constituents as well. And so to do this, a typical approach, and this is one that we followed, is we take normal urchins and abnormal urchins. Um, again, my skills with drawing uh, cartoons of urchins is kind of terrible. Uh, we extract messenger RNA from those. We purify it a little bit to try and get rid of ribosomal RNAs. Unfortunately, some of that's left over, but it turns out that's actually quite useful. We then take that messenger RNA, we sequence it with something called Illumina. Uh, in this case, it was done with MySeq, uh, for those that are familiar with it. Uh, this gen generates an enormous amount of sequence data. Uh, we then go through computational analyses, which allows us to basically assemble them as well as understand what is actually turned on and who might be there, okay? Uh, um, so in other words, transcriptomics uh, tells us, it surveys the genes which are being actively expressed. It also tells us about organ how organisms respond to stimuli and can include pathogens. Viruses in particular tend to be included by this approach. So what is happening to the host when we perform this based upon healthy and diseased or grossly normal and abnormal individuals? 
Uh, what we found is that these are all of the gene categories here. So basically, we collapse all of those transcripts into broad categories as to what they're actually doing. And then we compare expression profiles. These are all the ones that were differentially expressed, so statistically greater uh, in either the grossly normal or the abnormal. There's a, a very large number which were not statistically different from each other. What we find is uh, basically that the abnormal urchins had a much larger sort of representation of retrotransposons, which are basically genes uh, which perform a variety of functions, but there was mean that gene expression is actually happening, uh, replication and repair again, uh, as well as you know, some evidence of complementation, upregulation, and elevated retrotransposon activity. So uh, what's interesting is that we also observed that the ribosome uh, RNAs were actually decreased significantly in the abnormal urchins. That just tells us that the animals are shutting down and dying. Okay, so the overall picture is that basically the animals were dying and may respond to some sort of foreign microbe, particularly that complementation system of regulation tells us that, that there's something foreign in there that uh, they're responding to by basically creating molecules that would bind to them, right? So not the most informative, but uh, to give us some information about the animals are, are basically unhappy and are dying. So then we turned our attention to something uh, called amplicon sequencing. This is basically where we uh, take DNA uh, out of the host. We then uh, extract the bacteria out of the host. Sorry, we, we actually do both. We extract bacteria and, and the host at the same time. Uh, and then after that, we perform PCR on a certain gene called a 16S ribosomal RNA. Uh, this is a gene which is conserved across all bacteria. Uh, there's an equivalent in eukaryotes called an 18S, but essentially by PCR, we're able to amplify those. Each one of those PCR amplicons will have a different sequence depending on the species that is there. We then subject that to Illumina MySeq uh, as we did before, and then we perform computational analyses to understand who is there. So amplicon sequencing harnesses a gene which is in all bacteria, but varies in sequence according to the type of bacteria. So it tells us about the microbiome composition of these organisms. And so it will tell us whether things are variable from a healthy to a diseased or a grossly normal to an abnormal urchin. Um, and this is some results which didn't actually appear in the paper, but I'm happy to share them nonetheless, uh, because I knew that this question would probably come up. Um, this is an aggregate bar chart of the different types of uh, bacteria which are present. By the way, this is performed by Brian Villanova Cuevas, who is my uh, current graduate student. Um, essentially, we have here at the top here, these abnormal affected at site. We have the normal ones. These are the grossly normals at those affected sites. And then we have the reference site. So what pops out immediately is that we have two of these colors, which really sort of stand out. The first of this is here. This is a uh, basically Vibrios. Uh, Vibrios are sort of weedy taxa and across a variety of different marine habitats. They're involved in a uh, wide variety of different uh, things in the environment. Uh, they, some of them are disease causing, but I will say that this bar is made up for many, many, many different types of Vibrio, none of which stood out as perhaps being tightly associated with this condition. And then we have this here, which is something called cystinophilium. This is a fastidiosi bacteraceae, which is a mouthful. Um, that is normally an endosymbiont within eukaryotes. So perhaps that was an indication as to what was happening. Um, what about viruses? So uh, for viruses, it is much the same approach. We basically can take animals like diadema, we can homogenize their tissues, we extract virus particles by size filtration as well as nuclease treatment. So the idea is you get rid of everything which isn't a virus, uh, and then you basically extract nucleic acids from those, you sequence them, and you do computational analysis. So in this case, we are examining viruses which have uh, RNA as their genome. So viruses are weird in that they can have either DNA or RNA. Uh, we were focusing on RNA because they include most relevant R uh, viruses uh, for animals. DNA viruses would also be captured as far as their transcripts, uh, but we didn't really focus on those at all. So what about viruses? Uh, well, what we recovered were all of the red sequences on these phylogenetic trees, just to sort of explain what a phylogenetic tree is. Basically, it tells you about how related sequences are. So essentially, all of these, for example, on a single branch, they tend to be more closely related than those which are located very, very far out. So for example, this one here is very distantly related from the top one. What we recovered were actually several dicystroviruses uh, in diseased urchins. We didn't really see them in the healthy urchins. Um, these are mostly viruses that resemble plankton viruses. Uh, these are also a group of viruses which are not terribly pathogenic in any host at all. We tend to find them across a huge variety of very healthy hosts. And so there was nothing aside from these sister viruses that we could point to and say, well, that's probably a, a big viral signal. Um, uh, Judy 
mentioned that my specialty is in viruses. I get somewhat disappointed when I don't see viruses, but um, uh, we, we tend to work on anything which is uh, basically disease causing. So this turned our attention after going through bacteria and viruses to eukaryotic microorganisms, so protists in this case. And to do this, what we did is we looked at the transcriptomes and we pulled out 18S ribosomal RNAs, which are these genes which are conserved amongst all eukaryotes. And we did what's known as read recruiting. So we basically took all of the transcriptome libraries and we recruited them to these 18S uh, genes that we pulled out by something called BLAST. And we had a number of different types of eukaryotes, uh, everything from diatoms through to fungi. Uh, when we looked at the pattern of association with the abnormal urchin, which are those bars in red, really there was only one which popped out from a statistical standpoint, and that was this one called Phylaster apodigitiformis, okay, which is a type of cilia. This greatly attracted our attention because Phylaster belongs to a group of ciliates known as scuticociliates that are highly pathogenic in fish. They're not typically known to cause mass mortality. Uh, they are typically opportunistic infections in aquaculture settings and mariculture settings. But um, the fact that it was related to some kind of fish pathogen and it happened to be the one which tended to correspond with the disease definitely made it an attractive target for future research. Um, this is what it looked like. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we actually did independent lines of evidence. We sort of had this idea. We weren't really communicating with the rest of our partners or collaborative partners on this because we didn't want to say, hey, you should be looking for this because essentially, you know, that kind of means that you're only going to see what you're looking for. However, uh, and uh, Yazoo can answer this as well as other uh, histopathologists were involved in this, basically microscopy and veterinary histopathology confirmed that phylaster apodigitiformis was present only in the abnormal urchins or at least very heavily represented in the abnormal urchins and a few grossly normal animals from affected sites but not at all from the reference site. So this is what it looked like down the uh, down the microscope. This is a light microscope image. It's a peritricus ciliate. So it means that it has uh, these little hair-like structures all over the surface that allow it to move around. And they're all over the surface. It also has what's known as a scuticum, which you can't really see in this image, which is a tiny little groove there. Otherwise, a, a food, a mouth, if you will. Uh, and then histopathology. This is a slide that Yazoo provided that basically shows the interior of a spine and all of these little things here these are all phylaster-like ciliates, okay? So we uh, we communicated by email and we said, all right, what are you seeing? All right, uh, here's basically what we're seeing. And it basically, uh, we found this, that it was a consistent result. I should also mention that Terry work at the US Geological Survey out in Hawaii was looking at salamic fluid draws and found much the same thing uh, a few weeks earlier. Okay, so the next question is, you know, is it all the same thing? Is it uh, the same type of phylaster? So, uh, since, and this did not appear in the paper that came out recently, but I'm happy to share it. Essentially, we uh, received specimens working with collaborators from across the region, uh, and we extracted DNA. We then performed 60, or sorry, 18S uh, ribosomal RNA, PCR, and then we sequenced them. This resulted in a phylogenetic analysis, which you can see here, where I've put the flags uh, for the different uh, jurisdictions where we recovered these sequences. And this is a condensed version. There's many, many other sequences as well. But what we understand is that all of the sequences that we obtained from abnormal urchins from all of these different jurisdictions were 100% related for, to the culture that we actually obtained. I'll talk about the culture in the next slide, as well as a sequence of 18S that we pulled out of the disease transcriptome, all right? Um, it falls within this clade of phylasters, all right? So here's phylaster apodigitiformis, lucinda and guamensis, which are coral-associated uh, uh, phylasters. And it's different from other scutica ciliates that you can see here, okay? So what's interesting is that the transcriptome, we also pulled out a 28S ribosomal RNA, uh, which was 99.8% identical to phylaster apodigitiformis. And so that was pretty good evidence that that was actually what it was, okay? So you see very wide distribution of this one particular clade that happens to be a very highly, what we think is pathogenic organism. So after that, we can't just go on the few handful of sequences that we have. Uh, we then did something called quantitative PCR. This relies on the fact that uh, we can take DNA from the animal and the microbe, we can extract DNA, and then we perform PCR. But unlike normal PCR, we're actually looking at the production of the, um, the increase in PCR products over time. Uh, we can also introduce standards into that. And essentially, we can go back and work out how many copies of the actual um, gene that we're targeting was present in the template that we're adding to the material. In other words, tells us the abundance of the organism. And again, this is working with specimens that were collected by a, a very wide variety of, of individuals and organizations in the region. 
Uh, when we did this, we did this across a number of different types of tissues, including body wall gonads, spine base, uh, digestive tract, salomic fluid. We also looked at it in the water column in those water column samples I mentioned earlier. And in all cases, there was a significantly higher abundance of uh, this thing than in the grossly normal at the affected site. And we did not detect it, except for a few outliers uh, at reference sites at all. And they're probably just spurious PCR amplicons. And so this gave us more evidence that this organism is really tightly connected to this particular condition. But there's always going to be the question, is this a pathogen or is it an opportunist? Even if you see something like this, it might not be the thing that's actually causing it. It might be a very widespread microorganism that happens to recruit onto dying animals uh, that happens to be there at the time. This is something that we saw with sea star wasting disease and the sea star associated densifiers. And so we wanted to rule that out. And so the first thing that you need to do in order to really get at what the pathogenicity of a microbe is, is you need to be able to culture it to get it into a test tube in the lab. And so we were very, very fortunate. We worked with uh, Gabe Delgado, as well as Bill Sharp down at the Fish and Wildlife Commission in Florida, who work in the Florida Keys. Uh, we sent down some culture media, working with Pete Countway at Bigelow Institute, who basically told us the culture media, gave us some instructions for that. They were waiting and waiting and waiting for the condition to appear in the Florida Keys. Um, and magically, or unfortunately, I should say, one day in mid-June, or sorry, early June, might have been late May, I can't remember, it suddenly appeared as a small patch reef off of Key Largo in Florida. And they immediately retrieved some salamic fluid. This is actually one of the specimens that they collected. They put that into the culture media, sent it back to Cornell. We diluted it. We basically put it through an isolation procedure. This resulted in a uni sort of out or uni protist culture, if you will. It was still had bacteria in it, which I'll talk about how we controlled for that later. But essentially, it resulted in a culture of what we thought was um, the phylaster apodigitiformis, and we confirmed that by PCR. So really fortunate to have all of the chess pieces in place ready to go. We then were very fortunate that Josh Patterson at the University of Florida had a number of individual juvenile diadema antelarum that we could use for performing a challenge experiment. So we, after a few days after having the culture in a relatively pure culture, we went down to uh, the University of South Florida. We obtained those uh, those juvenile diadema. We exposed 10 of those naive di juvenile diadema to the culture. We also exposed 10 of them to a culture which had been filtered through a five micron filter. So in other words, all of the bacteria which were in the culture were still there, but not the phylaster cells because the phylaster is very large. And then we monitored uh, the animals for appearance of lesions or spine loss over time. Uh, and initially we were sort of watching and waiting and it was sort of one of those things where I came in every day and hopefully something's happened for the first few days, nothing happened at all. They looked quite happy. Uh, and then magically on uh, day four, uh, and then the subsequent days, they started to lose spine. And here's an example of one that uh, lost its spines. And so if we plot this out, essentially uh, all of them remained totally healthy over the course of a week long or 10 day long experiment, uh, whereas about 60% uh, of them died off within the first four days. Okay, after the first four days, I should say. A key component of this is then we then we were able to uh, were able to reculture the organism from here and uh, at the end from a diseased animal, and we re-identified it based on 18S. And so this definitively proves that this is actually the pathogenic agent some, through something known as demonstrating Koch's postulates, which is a series of criteria that were that came about in the late 1800s to assign a, a pathogenic cause to an organism. So what have we learned from this? We have successfully identified the causative agent of a major invertebrate mass mortality. This is also the first time any ciliate has been shown to result in any marine invertebrate disease. Um, most importantly, uh, and this is something I am personally very excited about, we've established a collaborative international network of researchers from across the Caribbean and parts of the United States as well to rapidly tackle marine disease events. Um, we, you know, it's it's super exciting to be able to work with so many people, and I believe that the progress that we made was really, really a product of this massive collaboration, uh, which otherwise would not have occurred at the speed at which it occurred. So, just getting back to these uh, key questions, we now know uh, the answer to this. We don't know the answer to environmental stressors that's under investigation. We are currently investigating uh, what has happened recently. Is this an invasive pathogen? This is done through. Uh, some collaborators that you can see here, including Aruba, uh, which we added after we performed this, uh, the main part of the study. Um, 
One thing I will emphasize is that we are looking for future collaborators for any marine mass mortality. Uh, we haven't delved too much into corals in my lab, but uh, we certainly can do it as well. Uh, one thing I can offer is that we are currently coming up with marine disease sampling kits for diadema, but also for other species. These are basically materials for collection and room temperature preservation and shipping, which are amenable to a wide range of approaches, species, and sizes of organisms. We just want to make sure that specimens are uh, collected and preserved in a way that will allow future investigators um, to be able to investigate them uh, to work out what's causing it. Uh, we're also working on an easy to use deployable molecular detection uh, protocol called LAMP, uh, Loop Mediated Isothermal Amplification for Phylaster uh, in Diadema. Uh, this basically will, you don't need much equipment, we're happy to provide all of that equipment that's needed, and it should increase participation by community scientists in monitoring um, the uh, spread of this condition. And then I'm also very interested in performing collaborative training opportunities in marine disease investigation, for example, training in molecular approaches and computational bio. So we'd love to collaborate just to say this is not an end point. This is the beginning and super excited to continue going on with that. And with that, I just have to say a big thank you. Uh, this is a very limited number of people that I put on this slide, mostly sort of my lab group up here, uh, my students, mostly undergraduates, uh, as well as some collaborators at USF, uh, including graduate students. Bella Ritchie and Jim Evans, who's a postdoc, um, but also just to say a very big thank you from all of the collaborators uh, from all across the region and indeed the world. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ian. Wow. You have summarized the fantastic, cooperative, complicated detective work on those tissues and fluids of the sick urchins that so very quickly produces surprise identification, not of a virus, nor even a bacterium, which many of us also expected, but a scuticocilia. And then for describing how cultures of this microeukaryote infected other specimens of Deantelarum in a transmission experiment that showed the scuticocilia was a cause of the 2022 die-off. I mean, that's a massive accomplishment. And then finally, how incredibly encouraging to hear that you are still keen to collaborate with our Caribbean partners. And we would like to um, open the floor now to questions um, for the speakers and perhaps other participants. Ask um, Alwyn to also turn on his video, thank you, Alan. And um, I, I will start with um, the questions that are in the chat. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. Uh, time check on the pendulum clock in the background. Um, but before we do that, actually, I, I'm going to make a comment to Ian, which is that um, he referred to environmental stressors as something as distinct from the diseases that are caused by living organisms. And I don't know if they changed their mind, but the histopathologists that I used to hang out with referred to these as, um, as abiotic diseases. And, and so they were also just a different kind of disease with a different stressor, but producing death. So why isn't it a disease too? But now back to the um, questions that are in the chat. Um, Steve Giddings has asked this question, probably of Alwyn. Could the patchy die off compared to 1983 to 94, from 1983 to 84, excuse me, result from the much lower population that existed in the 1980s. Their current lower abundance on reefs in 2022 would curtail the spread of the disease. Alwyn, would you like to address that? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, honestly, I, I don't think we can be sure, but it sounds reasonable that um, that, that that can be the case that if there's less and more patchy populations that it's more difficult for um, things to to spread around 
Um, yeah, it, it, it also depends on the main um, mechanism of spread, of course. Um, so I don't know if somebody else can say something about that. But, um, Well, I would also note that there was one huge difference between the two events in that in 1983, it started in Panama in a discrete area and was spread gradually over a period of 14 months before it had apparently traversed the entire wider Caribbean region. Whereas this time it appeared first in St. Thomas, but then two months later popped up in half a dozen other areas. and by two and a half months later was um, approaching a total of, of a dozen different affected jurisdictions that were sprinkled all over the Northern and Eastern Caribbean. So something was very different in setting this more recent mortality off from the earlier one. And, and I don't know if anybody else wants to uh, add another comment. Um, if not. Hi there, we, Judith. It's yes. Renata from Barbados. Hi, Ian yes. and Owen. Thank you so much for this. I mean, wow. We we kind of had diadema up into the 90s, which were really huge on the West, and they didn't die off until pretty much late 90s, early 2000s, because 1997, they were still abundant, but not on the South. And now they've switched. They're big on the South, and they're coming back slowly on the West. But my question was, if you're talking about Panama, and I think, Owen, you might have mentioned this. One of you, one of the two of you did um, about transportation by ships, because if you're talking about Panama um, and then just looking, I don't know if anybody's done the numbers on the increases in ship, shipping traffic through the canal. Um, and this would answer one of the other guys questions about over in the Middle East about why are they getting it over there. Um, ship traffic is global now. So has anybody started to follow up on that a little bit as well to see if they're actually seeing it in their you know, a pump out waters or bilge waters or anything like that or attached to their ships hulls. Because that would explain less movement in the 80s, but way more movement now. I'm thinking. I can, I can certainly speak to this, um, at least from a molecular detection or microbiological detection. We have not had the opportunity yet to focus on ballast water samples to look at uh, potential transmission. Um, I believe that there are other groups, uh, and Judy, you might know exactly who, but who are examining patterns of marine traffic, um, I believe, in Puerto Rico. Um, and basically, they'll be able to do a historical comparison. But uh, I would agree, probably traffic, boat traffic has increased since the early 1980s. But um, as of yet, we have no data to support that this is transmitted by boats at all. Um, there are many other vectors for which it might be moving around, and this is entirely speculative. Uh, everything from migrating birds uh, to dive gear through to uh, just water currents or perhaps other vectors that are bringing it. But uh, I'll be really interested to see and certainly very happy to look, or at least for others to look uh, in the region at uh, whether this phylaster actually occurs in ballast water or not. Thank you, Al, uh, Ian and Alwyn. So we already heard that the, we over here on the Caribbean, we had already heard that the diadema cetosum, which lives in the Red Sea, was dying in the Northern Gulf of Aqaba at the end of last year, as uh, Mohammed Al-Takawa had just confirmed when he asked to initiate contact with Alwyn. And I would add that Ian and perhaps others of the Caribbean network would also value interacting with us. And, well, sorry, interacting with him. And then I noticed that um, several people have put comments for him in the chat, um, noting that uh, we've discussed this a bit with Omri Bronstein in Israel. And um, Maya is, has said that she'd be happy to test samples if someone can send them or to provide the information about the PCR assay. So you are local colleagues can test them for yourself. And he has also asked um, if ballast water is one of the reasons for the disease distribution, it, should it have moved from the Caribbean to Aqaba? And, and I can tell you that it's also 
Diadema have been found dying in the Eastern Portuguese and Spanish islands off of Africa, the Eastern Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean, Eastern Atlantic, Spanish and Portuguese islands off the coast of Africa. And they have, and that's Diadema africanum. And then in the Eastern Mediterranean, as of about last November, uh, they, Diadema setosum started to die in Turkey and has now also uh, that die off has extended at least to Greece. Um, we haven't heard recently if it has reached the Mediterranean coast of Israel or not. And perhaps somebody who's listening in today can give us an answer to that question. But that's the species which has invaded the Eastern Mediterranean from the Red Sea and which is now apparently in trouble in the Gulf of Aqaba. And it would be really, really good to try to get some samples analyzed in a consistent fashion with what's been done over here to see if the same pathogen might be involved. And then we could, if so, then we really have to seriously consider the ballast water or other means of international transport. And, and I can just back up that uh, should you need any supplies or uh, information or anything to perform those analyses, uh, wherever you are, uh, we're super happy to facilitate that as well. Um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, basically there's access to all of the resources that are needed to do this, because sometimes, you know, uh, we, we don't need to transport samples to the United States or other places to be able to be done. Um, but please let me know by email. Several people have been wondering about um, whether or not what happened last year bears any relationship in terms of the cause, its causation to the um, die off of the diadema back in the 1980s. Is there any way of knowing if a scuticociliate was, was um, participated in that huge mortality event that started in Panama? Any ideas? Is Harris on the call here? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I can I can certainly speak from my perspective, and that is that. Uh, oh yeah, there's Harris. Go for it. Oh yes. Oh perfect. <laughs> Harris, would you like? Okay, to sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Um, uh, yeah, the the answer is we well, have no idea. I um, am kicking myself. Um, or not having preserved in the 80s samples um, that we could have used. Um, there's a complicated story about this, but uh, basically we don't have access to samples. So I think um, we'll never know. Um, some points on, um, on both talks um, since I started speaking here is um, Alan, um, in 83, we also saw a high recruitment right after the mass mortality, but unfortunately, and we were hopeful like you are, but um, it's petered up. As the adults died, there were no new larvae coming in. And um, uh, over uh, after a year, uh, we had no diadema in town. Um, as far as the diadema cetosum mortality, uh, I got the word that uh, it's also happening in Dahab right now. Um, it apparently is spreading all over the, um, at least the Gulf of Africa, a lot of the Red Sea. But it's important to remember that diadema cetosum in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, um, well, around the uh, Arab Peninsula, is not diadema cetosum. It's a different species. Um, and that is what has invaded Greece, according to Omri uh, Um We'll see uh, the, the question of why the ones in Greece are dying is something we hope to look at. This. And of course, this is something uh, that's only invaded very recently. So um, uh, it's not very abundant, and yet it's somehow either brought to the disease with it uh, which is doubtful because it must be larvae that came in, or um, again, 
uh, one has to look at what happens in ships. Uh, as far as the uh, traffic uh, increased in um, in Panama, uh, the boat traffic, um, obviously the traffic has increased through the canal. Um, but of course, this time, the disease didn't happen in the canal. It happened in, um, it started where it had ended uh, in 83. So um, we're still at a, uh, in the dark as to what actually caused that, uh, causes it to break out. Uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I'll just uh, add to what uh, Harris said about the diadema in the Red Sea not being cytosum. Um, I didn't mean cytosum as it is classically understood in the literature, and I based that name on Omni Bronstein telling us that it was the real cytosum, and I, by that I presume he means if you look at the original taxonomic descriptions of the species and any residual specimens that still exist. Um, but um, let's just agree that there is okay, a, um, yeah, there is a there um, is a a, a, a a species of diadema that's re restricted to the area of the Arabian Peninsula and which has invaded the Red Sea. The, uh, I mean, I'm I sorry, it has, this, has, has, no, it uh, occurs in the Red the, Sea and uh, has invaded the Eastern mm -hmm. Mediterranean. Where the question of nomenclature gets uh, incredibly um, complicated and yes. nobody here will be too interested in it. But basically, um, the red Gaidema savignae was uh, described by Aldrin from Red Sea specimens, which in fact, were not Didema savigni. There is no Didema savigni in the Red Sea. Um, but the point that I wanted to make about the different species is uh, there's also the question if it's going on in the Red Sea, will it spread all over the Pacific? Absolutely. And uh, because we've seen it that uh, so far, at least if it's, if it's the same thing, it's very species specific. Maybe, maybe it will not. <laughs> Well, have you heard any any uh, news about what the uh, whether or not the ciliate has been found in the Greek samples, or do we have any certain knowledge? No, I, I don't. Um, uh, Omri Bronstein is the person to ask, but um, I have not. Um, you haven't heard anything. Okay. Okay. Um, I see Esther Peters has raised her hand. Would Thank you, like you to add? And I uh, just wanted to uh, add a little bit more about the 1982 through 84 mass mortality event in the Caribbean. There were some samples that were, were collected. They were sent to uh, Bob Scheibling in Canada, uh, but they were in very poor condition and that couldn't be examined. So a couple of years later, 1985, uh, and then in 1991, there were some diadema antelarum mortalities noticed, uh, first off St. Croix, and then um, uh, in the, the Key West area. And Bert Williams, Ernest Williams, who was at the University of Puerto Rico and investigating marine mass mortalities um, in the Caribbean uh, back then, put together uh, a, a small group, very small, uh, of scientists interested in studying those, which included me for histopathology and um, Jack Bauer from University of Miami and um, Bob Bullock from Woods Hole as microbiologist. And later in the 1991 event, there was also a, a virologist from Auburn, uh, but in each of these cases, we um, received different urchins for our particular studies and did different things with them. And uh, while, while uh, Jack Bauer's work showed that there was Clostridium uh, bacteria that um, killed urchins with the same disease signs. 
and and I showed that there were gram positive bacteria on um, uh, muscle spines, um, uh, spine muscles, excuse me, uh, remnants, that these, um, we, we really couldn't say for sure that, you know, this was something that, you know, because there weren't enough of us and there weren't enough people out there sampling and there was a whole lot of other things going on. I have, I have explained this in a couple of book chapters that I've contributed to. And so, we really don't know. As far as the histopathology goes, I'm pretty sure I never saw any ciliates in those um, urchins. I sent those urchins to um, Gregory Beck at uh, University of Massachusetts because he was studying then the diadema um, immune responses and found that they were particularly susceptible to bacterial infections. Uh, as uh, in uh, relation to uh, the other species of urchins in the Caribbean. And so we really don't know, you know, at any particular time whether the, um, you know, what happened in the urchins, you know, in 2022 could have been the same thing happening in any of the other urchin outbreaks in the past. And so I did want to make that known that you, you really have to investigate everything um, as it occurs and hope that you can figure things out. Uh, and now we have wonderful uh, groups of people all across the area, as Ian has uh, explained so well, that are capable of doing a lot more of the um, you know, detailed diagnostic work that is necessary. And so I hope that, you know, with any other marine um, uh, event, mass mortality or, or disease or whatever, that we can utilize everybody's uh, talents and really get out there and investigate things as they are happening. So I, I'm very delighted that the, this group was able to do such a great job on this mass mortality event of the diadema. It has been an amazing collaborative event. Thank you, Esther. Um, I have a question for both Alan and Ian, um, or maybe for Ian, uh, from Morgan Haishu, who asked, why would a pathogen that is normally associated with fish all of a sudden be impacting sea urchins? I don't know if you had any thoughts on, you know, if you see this in another species, going over to uh, just the urchins and not affecting fish. So I turn that over to you. That's a really good Great. question. I think it comes down to um, basically the identity and, and of the, the ciliate itself. So uh, what we found is sort of a, a microorganism that is most closely related to Phylaster apodigitiformis, at least from a phylogenetic standpoint. Um, but the ciliate does form a separate clade when you look at its ribosomal RNAs. And so it's likely to be something which is uh, not quite Phylaster apodigitiformis, but um, a, a, relate, a highly related species. And so um, when I say that this is sort of a ciliate, which is normally associated with as a fish pathogen, um, what I mean is that they're known within this group to be fish pathogens, but this one specific one is probably not a fish pathogen. Um, it's difficult to say. I mean, there are some classic examples of things that can infect both, you know, fish as well as invertebrates. There are some types of viruses, for example, that can jump between uh, fish and copepods in agriculture setting. Uh, but it's in this case, we don't have any evidence of that at all. Um, to be honest, we haven't even looked at fish uh, in this in this instance. But it's probably I, I might have misspoken by saying that it was it's most closely related to a fish pathogen. It's not itself a fish pathogen. Thank you, Ian. That was um, a good answer. One other question I, we had related to this is. Any similarities, differences? Um, Judy had mentioned uh, the mass um, sea star wasting this uh, die off that had happened. Any similar similarities or differences um, or just thoughts and comments about those two events? Yeah, for sure. Um, so going into this, to be honest, I had, you know, in the back of my mind that perhaps this was a similar phenomenon. So the story with sea star wasting is that uh, while we initially identified that as being caused by a virus called the sea star associated densal virus, uh, subsequent work pretty much refuted its association uh, with the condition itself. 
Uh, we are still struggling to understand exactly what sea star wasting is. Um, there's nothing distinct from a microbial standpoint. Um, the best sort of estimate that we have is it's related to enhanced microbial activities at the animal water interface. So we believe that that's related to oxygen deprivation. So the idea is uh, at the very surface of starfish, if you have enough microbial activity, it depletes oxygen and basically suffocates the animal underneath. Um, but we don't really have any firm, firm evidence of that as yet. Um, but going into this, the observation that this condition occurred around harbors, still water habitats, uh, perhaps with this, you know, gooey water, which they were describing these hair like structures in the water made me think perhaps that this was the same thing. Um, but since that time, we've, we have thoroughly sort of identified the cause and it is not that. However, a little heads up, um, it is not exclusive on uh, sea stars that you might have other similar phenomenon as what we're observing here. It's just we don't actually see them in that previous work that I did uh, because we weren't really looking for them. Uh, but uh, as far as the absolute etiology of it, it's difficult because we don't know the exact etiology of the West Coast sea star wasting. Uh, but we, you know, uh, the other important take home is that echinoderms really kind of have a very limited way by which they tell us they're unhealthy. Uh, so basically with sea stars, they just drop a leg, they start to slough off their skin. Same thing happens with this. These things drop their spines, their epidermis starts to slough off. So even though it looks broadly the same, the etiologies can be remarkably different. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but other than to say that after eight years of investigating sea star wasting and uh, many, many red herrings along the way, uh, we're still not sure on that, but we are certain on this one. Thank you very much. Um Another question we had from uh, one of the participants is any relationship to hurricanes? You showed some really great images from SeaWiff imagery of um, looking at chlorophyll um, A. Um, any op you know, opportunities or did you look at anything related to hurricanes? So uh, the short answer is that uh, this occurred during a period when there were no hurricanes. Um, in fact, last hurricane season didn't really kick in until uh, well after our sampling period or when the disease you know, first emerged and it pretty much spread everywhere. Um, I only know that because I traveled to a bunch of the sites and uh, was not my travel was not affected by the hurricanes. Um, but basically, um, we have not looked as yet for hurricane impacts, say from the previous season. Um, I believe that there I, I might be misreporting this from others who have done this sort of work, but essentially there was no direct relationship with previous sites that were hurricane damaged in the occurrence of this condition. But um, I don't know, Judy, you might have more information on that or Alwyn. Um, no, but um, the, there, there were relationships to previous, recently previous rainfall events on some islands, but not on, on, on other islands, which um, that relationship found the, in part, the concept that it might've been enhanced productivity in the plankton that was related to the onset of the disease, but we can't really address that question yet, maybe in the future. So I'll ask, um, a, a pose a question that Raven, whose last name I don't know, uh, asked, how does this discovery relate to ecosystem restoration and protection? Can it help managers or governments in their implementation of ecosystem restoration or protection. Anybody care to address that? Uh, sure. I think it's the, um, um, I think it's the first step. This discovery is the first step towards helping restoration and management. Uh, like just by knowing, of course, we, we cannot really, <clears throat> Um, help restoration yet, but if we also start to understand um, why this occurred now and if this still is going to occur in the future, that will definitely help um, <clears throat> managers and uh, restoration attempts. Uh, and I think the um, the lamp kit that Ian described is also a very great first step to like to know locally what is happening and um, what kind of measures we can possibly take. 
And, and I will add that um, all these attempts at restoration will ultimately pu prove futile if we don't get on with the serious business of restoring the health of the water quality in the environment in which these organisms live. And if this latest sad news of another massive widespread disease can't help kickstart some of the political will to seriously start to, to redress the problems that we have caused in the environment of Earth in general and the Caribbean in particular, um, then, then our efforts will ultimately have been in vain. So anybody who knows how to sway public opinion, please help us. Um, another question we had was related to the sargassum um, spread that we're having. We're having a major uh, bloom of sargassum throughout the Caribbean, um, and that had, did occur uh, in the year um, last year in several areas. And uh, Ian, you had mentioned um, earlier about um, areas that have low um, oxygen um, might be related. Um, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about potential relationship to sargassum. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, you know, the sargassum blooms, obviously, uh, when they shoal, they actually decay um, quite quickly. Uh, and they undergo, as they release the nutrients, um, basically this series of changes, they stimulate microbial growth that in turn can actually reduce overall oxygen availability to surrounding waters. Um, the huge amount of organic matter that they release when they're undergoing diet, we call it diagenesis, when they, when they degrade, um, basically can also potentially stimulate microorganisms like, you know, phylaster. Um, I can say, uh, and I believe that I'm allowed to share this result, we have tried sargassum extract on basically phylaster. It does not appear to grow well on it at all. Um, so, uh, you know, phylaster itself is, in addition to being a pathogen that we now know, it's also a bacterivore. It eats bacteria in the surrounding environment. And so one possibility, though, is that when you have enough of this uh, altered sort of dissolved organic compounds coming off of decaying uh, sargassum, uh, that feeds bacteria, and then those bacteria are basically attracted to phylaster. So you might see some phylaster coming up after that. But we have no data as yet to support a direct link between any of the sargassum sort of shoaling that's occurring right now or has happened in the past and uh, the occurrence of this diadema scuticociliotosis. One of the things, hi there, I just wanted to ask, because that was my question, Patricia, because we've been getting so much sargassum, we, I, in Barbados, we get a lot of sargassum that's coming up onto the beach, getting buried when the sand starts to cover it, and then you get a big wave event and pulling all of it back out again. Is there anything that might be happening in that almost like intertidal sand zone where it's buried and then coming back out that could be causing those huge blooms again that might like push it a little bit um, and just making that water more anoxic as well at the same time, which is all near shore kind of thing happening. For, for for sure, and you know, as the as the sargassum gets buried, it it basically exists in a more anaerobic environment, which means that the degradation is slowed down quite considerably uh, compared to out in open ocean waters. So, I, there is every possibility that either being sort of physically washed out or leaching materials through groundwater discharge, uh, that it might lead to more productive conditions in coastal waters. Um, I haven't seen any data to support that it leads to outright hypoxia, which has, has a very precise scientific definition of 20% of normal oxygen levels. Um, but it probably reduces oxygen demand uh, a little bit out there, or oxygen availability, sorry. Um, but it would be interesting to investigate that, particularly um, as new approaches for getting rid of mass rafts of sargassum, including burial, uh, come online. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Um, I will ad uh, address a question that Mohammed asked me, which is what are the main expected environmental consequences of losing the sea urchin? And I'll start by saying, well, you know, its populations were really low across most of the Caribbean uh, last year when they started to die in so many places. Um, and so probably not too consequential in the short term, but this just sets back 
the any possibility that they might rebound on their own a little more quickly than they were doing previously. But there were some small pockets, um, particularly in places along the north coast of Jamaica that I know well, that in which the diadema had really rebounded significantly by the early to middle 1990s. And in those areas, you know, the corals were really doing an awful lot, um, were a lot, lot more successful at reoccupying the um, previously dead uh, surfaces of the skeletons that had become overgrown with algae. Um, and some of them, some of them having died, it will be admitted as a result of the bleaching events and other outbreaks of disease and corals um, that were occurring at that time period. Um, and in these areas where there were locally really nice little pockets of, of diverse coral growth, um, up until about 2000, the spring of 2018, and that's when stony coral tissue loss disease roared through the, along the Jamaican coastline. And unfortunately, we lost many of the corals that had been successfully recovering after hurricanes and leaching and other traumas. Um, so there was a lot more suddenly uh, open space for the for the uh, algae to colonize. And you know, I would hope that the diadema would have been reducing their abundance again. Um, but those populations suffered incredible losses last spring. They were one of the first islands in which um, major uh, catastrophe, that was, in which it was a major catastrophe because there were so many hundreds and thousands of dead urchins piling up in the sand channels. Um, however, everywhere, like it was said earlier, after the um, epidemic had um, worked through the population within a, a, a month or so, um, people were reporting seeing live diadema, some of, some of which were small enough that they had to have been uh, recruits on the plankton last year. But some individuals were um, of such a size that they must have been survivors of the of the um, die-off when it occurred. And I suspect that they are those urchins that had retreated so far into the cracks and crevices in those reefs that they had been in, a, um, in an environment of very low water flow and perhaps not been exposed to contact with the urchins that were closer to the reef surface and uh, infecting each other when they when the pathogen arrived. So there were some modest survivors and, um, and there were some recruits. And yes, I know as Harris said, uh, that may not indicate that next year or even later this year, there will still be um, lots of recruits and small juveniles on the reefs, but we can, we can hope as much. Um, Do we have um, any questions? I, I wanted to see if anyone has any last questions. Uh, we're going to show one quick slide. Um, and then I'm going to ask Alwyn and Ian to kind of uh, wrap us up with um, any kind of closing thoughts, big messages, next steps. Um, we are seeing a lot of interest from folks in um, who are here today and following up on both tissue sampling, restoration. Um, so uh, we will come to you to answer those questions. Um, just real quickly, I wanted to share the um, the website for the Diadema um, Response Network. And again, I just wanted to share this. Uh, this is the tracking map and the way where everyone has been sharing information um, on uh, where uh, die-offs have been occurring. We encourage you to keep uh, making observations. We will be making a new map that takes all of the 2022 data and putting it in one area so that we can have a clean slate and I hope we don't get more um, observations, but we do appreciate everyone who has been collaborating um, on this. 
Um, so I encourage you to uh, check that out. We'll be posting the papers that um, both Ian and Alwyn have published there, um, as well as additional resources. So we um, encourage you to keep being part of that. And to close up, I'd like to ask um, Ian and Alwyn to maybe start with Alwyn first. I know a lot of people are um, got a really good look at the whole die off across the whole region um, with your talk and also that shimmer of hope that you talked about, about the restoration and people interested in how do you actually do restoration. Um, so I'll ask if you can close um, with some final thoughts on that. And then Ian, um, to kind of wrap up on the collaborative effort that you and uh, all the colleagues have been doing and what a tremendous um, opportunity that has been and then to talk more about your next step. So if you guys could say a few words, that would be great. Go for it, Alwyn. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I like Ian's vision of uh, this collaboration uh, that we started is, is actually beginning. I really enjoyed working together with everyone. And um, yeah, we'll continue um, working on the on the shimmer of hope, work on uh, restoration approaches. And um, uh, anyone that is interested in those is, of course, welcome to contact me. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Judy, Patricia, and others from Agra, uh, and everyone that uh, that participated. Thank you, Alan. And I'm just going to add: um, a lot of people are asking questions like, "How do you actually do restoration?" And I know you've given some good uh, talks before about, you know, what it actually takes. And hopefully, we can follow up with you more on, you know, how much effort it takes, what kind of uh, success you're seeing, what are the actual steps that you need to take if someone wanted to start a larval rearing program and started to do outplanting. Um, so uh, we'd love to be able to follow up with you on that. So thank you very much. Um, sure. Ian, I'll turn it over to you so that you can wrap us up. And again, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to say another very big thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you uh, for uh, all of the opportunities that we've had to collaborate across the region. And like I said, this is just the beginning. Super excited to work with partners all over the world, including uh, anybody uh, elsewhere in the Mediterranean and, and others. Um, I think that we have some exciting sort of new avenues uh, to which we would like to tackle in the future. For example, we're still trying to understand the characteristics of phylaster and how it grows on different types of materials, including the sargassum that you mentioned, Renata. Um, and also trying to understand more about the environmental factors that altered the balance potentially between the phylaster and diadema itself, um, and how that might change in the future, how it's transmitted, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So super exciting future work to be done. Looking for collaborators around the world. If you're interested, uh, please get in contact with me. My email address is uh, in, the, in the chat function there, and Agra can distribute it as needed. Uh, but uh, wonderful to work with you and wonderful to share all of our results. So thank you very much. And with that, we will formally close the meeting. I see that Shirley has written in the chat that um, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes. I know Ian has to leave for a class in a couple of minutes. So it's a couple of minutes at most to stick around with him. Um, thank you also very much. We're just delighted that uh, this work has attracted such a large um, amount of interest from people who are scattered uh, really around the globe. And I think that bodes well for the future of collaborative research in the tropics. <laughs>